Okay. If you look at the painting behind me, um, it's called uh, La Tertulia del Café Pombo, which in English is something like uh, the talks at the Pombo Coffee House. Um, it portrays some of the intellectuals in Spain in the 20th century uh, gathering and hanging out at this coffee shop called Pombo. The guy standing uh, is called Ramon Gómez de la Serna, and he is the individual that introduced the, uh, the avant-garde into the Spanish literary world. Um, he became famous with some short, uh, witty aphorisms, sometimes were hilarious, sometimes were philosophical. Like he said things like, uh, uh, time uh, tastes like dry water, or uh, the most important thing in life is not to die. So that was Ramon. And the, um, but the, the painting is a really good example of how uh, coffee houses became a popular place for uh, intellectual uh, exchange in, in Europe in the 18th century. Uh, you have people from different backgrounds, you put them together, you give them this new stimulating drink, and they started to talk to one another in groups and nonstop. Um, they bring their own ideas, they challenge the ideas, and they came up with new ideas. And this had such an impact that even author Stephen Johnson claimed that uh, coffee houses in the 18th century were crucial in the development of the Enlightenment in that century. So in a way, uh, we could say that uh, modernity, as we know it, it, was brewed in coffee houses all along Europe. Now, if we look closer at the picture, I mean, was it really coffee what these guys were drinking at those hangouts in these coffee houses? It doesn't look like that, does it? So uh, let's now move into other uh, significant places uh, in time and space where uh, artists, thinkers, writers, and more important, common people uh, go together to share their thoughts and their ideas. Um, this one here is David Barnes. He's in Dublin, in Ireland, and he became a literary institution in the 18th century during the anglo irish literary revival. Uh, James Joyce used to hang here, and he brought here his character from the Ulysses Leopold Bloom. Uh, Samuel Beckett was also one of the regulars at the place. Uh, this other place is City Lights uh, in San Francisco. This bookstore became the mecca of the beat generation in the 50s and 60s. It appears in Kerouac's novels, and most of the beat writers publish their work here. If you think about the name, uh, it couldn't be more appropriated. City Lights uh, was and still is one of the beacons in the America progressive thinking. Now, this place uh, is called Café La Habana. Is in Mexico City. And it was here where uh, Fidel Castro and Che Guevara planned the Cuban Revolution in the 50s, right there in those tables. And it was here too where uh, young Roberto Bolaño and Mario Santiago in the 70s conspired against the whole Mexican literary establishment. Uh, it was this place too that was renamed Cafe Quito in Roberto Bolaño's The Savage Detectives novel. Uh, here we have uh, Roberto Bolaño and Mario Santiago. They look like a couple of nice guys enjoying some tacos, but they're probably thinking how to sabotage the next uh, literary event. And, well, and now these two guys are my friend Paco and I in Austin, Texas, 2009, eating hot dogs. Uh, you could tell from the similarities in the two pictures that uh, we were kind into the Sabbath detectives. And in fact, we were. Uh, Mexican author, uh, Juan Villoro, he defined the Sabas detectives as life investigators, uh, inspectors of the experience. And, you know, we kind of like bought into that type of thing. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Paco and I. Uh, Paco and I met in, in Dublin in 2004. At the time, we were two fresh engineers coming from Spain with zero experience, but very eager to gain a lot of it mostly in bars, I guess. So we met, and the next day we were at the bar, uh, drinking Guinness and talking about the books that we love and planning our next trip. So one of those trips uh, brought us to, to here, to the US. And we made a, uh, during that road trip, uh, Paco was actually reading The Sabbath Detectives, the novel from Bolaño. And you see, Paco, when, when he likes books, he underlines them. And I noticed that he was underlining this book a lot. So a few months later, we made another trip to Australia this time. 
And I remember in that trip, uh, I was reading the book and I finished it and we were in Melbourne in a bar again and we we're talking about these things, about the book, how much we love it because we had fresh. And I remember, I remember I was telling Paco, man, I love this book so much, but somehow I feel safe that I didn't read it when I was a lot younger because I'm pretty sure it could have changed my life. But I was wrong because we kept traveling and we started to fantasize about uh, opening this perfect spot that could have all the things that we loved. So we, we got relocated in different places around the world because of our engineer job. And at some point, again, we ended up in the same city at the same time, Dallas, Texas, in 2012. And we said, it's now or never. So we made it. And in 2014, uh, this um, enthusiastic beer fuel conversation became a reality. And we opened the Wild Detectives. I guess you could say that the Wild Detectives is the result of 10 years of friendship, uh, of two guys wishing for a space that could combine uh, literary stuff with hanging out. I mean, and since we opened, our plan was clear. Gather people, feed them culture, and get them talking. And our plan, and you know, everything we do gravitates around that same idea. Uh, music shows, readings, plays, poetry, like ordering books. If you come to a place and you try to get a book that we don't have it, we will order for you. Now, we won't mail it to you and we won't charge you shipping cost. We'll make you come to pick it up and we'll buy you a drink when you get it. Like things like that became popular fairly quick. Others, not so much. When we open, we have Wi-Fi uh, seven days a week and we notice that uh, people at the place, Friday nights, Saturday nights, they were working all night long behind the computers with headphones, not talking to anyone. So we cut it, the Wi-Fi. And we said, okay, I mean, we feel that weekends are for disconnecting. So we introduced the weekends without Wi-Fi to chorus conversation. Because conversations are key into what we're trying to do. When we did this uh, weekends without Wi-Fi thing, we post this question in our website and we ask people, do you think that uh, Hemingway or, or Faulkner or Kerouac had become themselves, had they stay home all day, all night behind the typewriters? We don't think so. They went out and leave. And maybe they drank a little too much when they did that. But they went out and gained experience and they brought into their stories. Because human interaction and conversations, those are the raw materials for the stories that we love. And we wanted our place, we wanted the Wild Detectives to be a place that facilitates people to be in other people's stories. If, if you think about it, uh, just think about the conversations that you remember most fondly, the ones that are still in your head as if they happened yesterday. I'll tell you one of mine, quick. I was 20 years old, I, uh, I did a quick trip to England from Spain with a couple of friends, and on the way back, we got stuck in in the, in the city, in the north coast of, of Spain. So we had to spend the night there and the three friends, we started talking about the books that we like and so on. And at some point, one of us started to tell the story of the black cat from Poe, the short, uh, greedy story. And we got so into the story that at some point, this cat popped up and scared the hell out of us. And then what I remember really from the conversation is that from that point on, we moved into things that we really care. We started things about, I guess, mostly girls and girls that didn't like us, but things that we really care for. So by, by sharing uh, some ideas about some books that we loved, we moved into a more intimate conversation. We connected at a different level. I guess because literature in general is more about life. And it's so easy to go from the story in that book to your own story. I think we also connected because we share something that we had enjoyed alone. Because reading, as opposed to going to the movies or going to a music show, is something you do on your own. And when you're reading, you're missing that connection that you get with someone when you talk about something that you love. And at the end, I mean, when, when, when we're missing those, those connections, I mean, it's really hard to get back to, to what you're trying to do. So, Talking about books is something that it gets you connected to a different level. Like, um, 
say, say, say that you're going to, when you, when you are talking to someone about that, that, that book that you get, you get in, into a level of connection that is really hard to get in, in different aspects of the thing. And talking about it, I mean, is, is not just as important as, as enjoying this feeling that you have with someone else. I mean, talking about books is also important because otherwise they will get neglected. They will become this special thing for special people with special skills. I mean, like, like it's happening already to classical music or to poetry. I mean, you, you see that, that sometimes we get to, to, to refer to people as, oh, that's the guy that likes classical music. Oh, who, which guy? Oh, yeah, that's the guy that reads poetry. We cannot let that happen to books. I mean, if we don't talk about them, we don't bring back to the level they belong, we will miss them, like poetry, which is already almost missed. But, you know, I agree that day-to-day, uh, -day, everyday activities don't foster this type of conversation. I mean, you can picture yourself at your office, and you have, you have this guy coming to you and say, hey, what's up, uh, did you watch the game last night? And you go, oh, the game, no, actually, I was reading my Crime and Punishment from Dostoevsky, and I really love how this guy uh, is trying to kill people with this crazy theory. You know, that might compromise your invitation for the next uh, Super Bowl barbecue. So this is happening because uh, this type of conversations need their own atmosphere, their own environment their own space, which are bars. Bars where you connect with strangers. Bars where you get as eloquent as you can, as you can get. Uh, and we want our space to, to encourage uh, people to hang out, to share the stories, to hang out smartly, to, to change ideas. Because when you share your own story to someone, you are opening a new reality to that person. And that is what culture does. It opens new realities every day. So, you know, when, when, we, when, you, when you learn, when you're reading a book, somehow you are learning something. You're having thoughts about the previous thoughts that were in the book. And when you talk to someone about that book, you're passing those thoughts and that learning into someone else. And when you keep doing that, you're spreading that knowledge. So you think about it when, when you're reading a book and when you're talking about a book, you're not just doing something good for your own. You're doing something good for all mankind. Like, nowadays in the Google Times, uh, voice is more valuable than information. A voice is how we add singularities into the stream of culture that we have around us. Voice is, is experience distilled, and we all have one, and it's priceless. So, read books, hang out, and please share your voice, because we need it. Thank you so much.